House National Congress Reform, BMCR, presents Nation Watch. Hello and welcome to another edition of Nation Watch, a production of the People's National Congress Reform. Today we're going to be talking about salary increases and the cost of living. Joining me in studio today to discuss this very important matter which is close to the heart of every single Guyanese is Mrs. Valda Lawrence, former Minister of Government and immediate past chairman of the People's National Congress Reform. Welcome, Valda. Thank you very much, Mervyn. It's good to be here. Good morning, viewers. Well, I'm sure everyone is delighted to see a fresh smiling face. We've had mostly men, in fact we've had exclusively men on the program so far, so thank you very much for gracing us and our viewers with your presence. Let's get started immediately with this whole issue of salary increases which have been the subject of massive propaganda campaign. Tell us what your views are on increases generally and we will then get down to discussing some of the impacts. Well, thank you, Marvin, and thank you for asking me that question. But before we begin, if you would allow me, I would Certainly. like to shout out to all of those NGOs, organizations, um, agencies that are presently highlighting the 16 days of activism of violence against women and girls. And I want to congratulate you on your efforts and ask that we continue to work not only with our women and girls, but with our men and our boys to ensure that we can be able to eradicate violence against anyone, be it women and girls or boys and men. Thank you, Mervyn. Thank Mervyn, you very much for that. <laughs> salary increases. Um, it always brings mixed emotions. And I think this time, coming from the present administration, it is very disappointing. Very, very disappointing. I mean, I don't have to tell the Guyanese people, they are aware that when the, this government campaigned, they campaigned on a 50% increase for public servants. Mm -hmm. Public servants. And we are what, over two years now into their governance and what we have seen being given to the public servants is unacceptable, especially given the fact that the high increase of food prices and other commodities are staring these people in the face. Unlike other persons who will have other assets, and so many public servants don't have the type of assets to go and leverage with the banks and financial institutions to get large loans to cover their expenses if they're building a home, if they're extending their home, if they want to buy a car, you know, they don't have that. So um, whatever borrowings they can have is cut because of their income. <coughs> and when you look at the cost of price, um, food prices. Um, we note, I made some notes, that the that food inflation rate is now at 11.2 percent. Food inflation rate is at 11.2 percent. And there's now, an official number? And that's an official number from World Data Information. <coughs> and, and Marvin, I don't have to go and tell that to the ordinary Guyanese out there who don't have the cash at their disposal because they feel it every day in their, in their lives. I was at the market the day before yesterday, and you know, I had a good laugh because take for instance pumpkin. You know, pumpkin would always carry a flat price, $200, $100, $400, and so on. But there was no $100 pumpkin. There was no $200 pumpkin. The smallest piece of pumpkin was being sold for $260. And one consumer came to the vendor and said, um, could I have half of the 
um, two six the piece of pumpkin, and the response was, "If you get somebody, I'm gonna cut it in half and, and sell you." Um, and so we know who is on the those of us who are on the ground. We understand the plight of our people. Um, we have said it over and over again at our co press conferences, both PNC and APNU press conferences, that people are struggling. People are struggling. If you take what the government has done, 8% across the board, unlike what we did when we went into office, we use a step approach. The highest percentage for those persons receiving the minimal salary, and then we increase it as we went along. We decrease it rather as mm -hmm. we went mm -hmm. along. So those persons working for 500,000, 300,000, and so they got less. But the persons at the bottom of the scale, they got more. That didn't happen this time. Mm -hmm. If you also note what took place when we gave those increases, they were tax-free. This increase of 8% is <coughs> not tax-free. So it is being taxed at 33 and a third percent. And so you're giving with one hand, you're taking away with the other hand. And at the end of the day, what it does, it just balloons the prices on the market because everybody will raise their prices. It's a norm in Guyana. People will raise the price as soon as they hear government is going to give an increase, irrespective of which government is in place. So the prices are going to balloon. You're giving this increase at the time of Christmas, which everybody celebrates, and everybody goes out there and shop. And so basically, you know, at the end of December, people are going to start questioning, did I really get an increase? Did I really get retroactive for 12 months? What is it I got? Because where is it? Well, that is a quite interesting question because someone worked out, I think it may have been Mr. Winston Jordan, your colleague, former minister, mm -hmm. <clears throat> had worked this thing out and arrived at a position where 8% for the average public servant will be in the region of $150 per day mm -hmm. with increased bus fares at maybe $120, $140 per short drop. It means that 8% for the average public servant is equivalent to a daily bus fare. How do you relate to that as a, the manager of a home? Well, I wouldn't even worry with the bus fare. I would worry with the bread or the biscuit that I got to give my children in the morning to go to school. I would worry about what I'm putting in the lunch cake. I would worry about my child who has to travel from point A to point B because they're going to a school that is only situated at point B. I, I would be concerned about that. I would be concerned about myself as a public servant who is expected to be on the job at X time, who is expected to dress in a certain manner, to present myself in, in, in an acceptable, cleanly manner, and so on, and dress appropriately. What is it really going to do for me? And that's why I'm saying, you know, after, after the receipt of this money, at what the then? end of this month, at the end of December, then people are going to be questioning, what did we really receive? Because, you know, Guyanese people can now make a choice as to whether the AP and UAFC government had their interests at heart as opposed to the PPP government. Because we didn't only give increases to bridge the gap left by the PPP after their 23 years in office, where they arbitrarily give the public servants 4% and 3% and 5% and no, and no percent. And so 
when we got into office, despite it was only half of the year, we, were, we went in in May, um, we still sought to find ways to be able to give the public servants a tax-free increase. But more than that, we give them a bonus. We gave them a tax-free bonus. And they got one month's salary without tax. And they got their increase. And we did that. As you will note, it is documented from 2015 through to 2019. We gave to the public service, not because we were a government who wanted to give. We weren't Santa Claus, but we recognize that the gap in terms of existence, especially for our public servants, some of them were put in the bracket of the working poor. When we got into office, people were got, getting 20 something thousand dollars a month. And I'm talking about head of households who are working for 20 something thousand dollars a month. So one can understand why we had to put in place those measures, which we did so drastically, to ensure that persons were able to live comfortably. We could gradually increase their position from where we found them to where we left them. So people can now look at the AP and new track record as it regards to public servants and other employees. Because even in the private sector, we raised the minimum wage in 2016 across the board to $55,000. So I hear the government talking about $60,000. So like if they, all of a sudden they come into office and they're giving $60,000. It's not true. $55,000 was the minimum wage. The order is there for everyone to see. And what they have basically done is add five thousand dollars to it. Uh, <clears throat> um, okay, viewers, you tuned to Nation Watch, production of the People's National Congress Reform. It's Sunday, 27th November, 2020, 2022, and we're heading closer to Christmas. We're discussing salary increases, the cost of living, and related matters with Mrs. Valda Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence, this recent World Bank report in Guyana places poverty at a rate of 48%. 48% of our population is living in poverty. The official inflation rate by projected for the end of the year is somewhere in the region of 7 to 10%. The government of Guyana has awarded public servants an increase of 8%. How do you reconcile these numbers to make sense? Well, you or know, can you at all? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I would really be happy if the government would share with the population, not the opposition, share with the population how they arrive at this 8%. Because remember, there was no collective bargaining. There was nothing with the unions and so on. They just arbitrarily, as they usually do, impose 8% um, on the public servant's salary. And, and as I said before, if price inflation is that high, let me backtrack a little because the government did predict that inflation rate by the end of the year would have been 4.1%. That's the initial projection. Yes, that was the initial projection. Yeah. And now, um, I have noted that they're saying it's going to be 7% or around 7%. Mm -hmm. And we've got to take that with a pinch of salt and look to see what is happening. Because we continue to see the movement in commodity prices, not only in Guyana, but around the world. Um, some of our neighbors are not doing as well as we're doing. They're worse off. But still, what we note is that their systems, their social systems has kicked in. Mm -hmm. 
in our <coughs> country, we see two things happening, Mervyn. One, the government in its budget for 2022 declared a cost of living, an ease of cost of living amount in the vicinity of $5 billion that they have set aside um, to ease the cost of living in Guyana for persons who um, are unable to cope with it. What we have not seen is a comprehensive plan that was brought to the National Assembly or any of the programs rolled out so far. Not one of them was brought to the National Assembly. Where it can be debated, you can hear their views of both sides of the house, etc. What we see is the Santa Claus approach. The government gets up tomorrow morning and the president announces that he's going to give the fishermen money, he's going to give a riverine grant, I think a penny bank money of $25,000. Mm -hmm. He's going to do a household um, yeah. grant. He's going to do X, he's going to do Y, he's going to do Z. So this lump sum, this $5 billion that Santa Claus has in his bag is being used willy-nilly and what has happened is that corruption, and not, I am not the only person saying that. Go back to the former U.S. ambassador's um, Interview. view yeah. in the newspapers, and you will see corruption has taken over all of these initiatives. Because everywhere you go, Marvin, if you go in the river and community, people are complaining they never got the grant. Oh, yeah. They're, and, and they're saying that they are fishermen too, and they didn't get no grant. They're saying they are farmers. They didn't get any grant. And the Reverend Grant, they didn't get it. You go on the, in the other regions, people tell you they never get the household grant. <coughs> persons said they were. They were not at home when the persons were there, and they promised to come back. They never come back. Then you have the, the school grant and all of these things. It has not worked. It has not impacted the lives of our people. It has not. It is like money come, money go. It's we, like a remittance from yes, abroad. Yes, it, it's flowing. You collect it's it, you spend flowing. it. You collect yeah. it, you spend it. And so the government has to sit down and stop blowing this trumpet about all these initiatives that they have rolled out because they need to get down to put in proper programs, not just the programs, but systems in place to ensure that the monies meet the people who it's intended for. If we continue at the rate that we're continuing, we will remain at stage one. And that is why the leader of the opposition has been putting several proposals out there to the government in order to address in a realistic manner this burden that is on not only the heads of households but also on our pensioners etc i didn't mention them before we get to the pensioners and <laughs> and, and the proposals this five billion dollar package that was set aside to deal with the issue of cost of living. Is that where the money came from for the salary increases, or was it from another no, line? No, no, it wouldn't come from there. Come, come from come another line. From another line after. I was curious because one of the first things that occurred to me is that if the five billion was depleted to the extent that all that remained <laughs> no, was a possible 8%. No, 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 the, the five billion would be. <laughs> would not at all have anything to do with, with that line item for increasing salaries. So, um, so, so, so the government and the president get um, an X for that because obviously <laughs> I was maybe trying to see if, if they could have gotten a half star. <laughs> but it means that from the inception they set aside specifically 8% and did not go say to revisit this, this provision 
in the face of, of changing economic circumstances? Um, let, let me say this. What I have been asking myself when I saw online the increases for the joint services. That's quite interesting. And yes, it's quite interesting. And the question which jumped out at me was, whom did the government speak with? I will give you a, 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 an example. Let us take, for instance, let's take, for instance, um, someone, look, a chief inspector. A chief inspector is receiving $178,630, and they will now receive $185,000. And then they go on to say, a chief inspector, five years and more experience, will receive $185,000. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand that. So if tomorrow you turn an inspector, you are promoted to an inspector, you mm -hmm. get 185000 And you've been there for 20 years. And I've been there for 20 years, <coughs> and I get $185,000. And it goes on with a cadet officer. It goes on with the senior superintendent. It also um, speaks to... Um, station sergeants, etc., and so on. So let me show you sergeants. Sergeants, and this is not my figures. This is the figures coming out from the government. This is what it says about a sergeant. A sergeant gets $128,056 a month and will now get $140,000. A sergeant with five to ten years' experience will now get $145. We are seeing the step there. Mm -hmm. A sergeant more than ten years will get $150,000 a month. Here again, we see the step. But as we go through this entire salary adjustment that is being made here, we are seeing more than ever where the person who just was just promoted or newly promoted into the job, that they're getting the same monies as those persons who have been there for 10 years, 15 years, etc. It is repleted. Persons can go and they can look for themselves and they will be able to see. So that's why in the beginning I said, I would like to know, you know, how they arrive at this um, increase. And the same thing goes for the public servants, um, not the joint services, for the public servants who would have received the 8% taxable um, increase. There's an interesting observation made with respect to the police adjustments, the joint services adjustments, <clears throat> the observation was made that by some almost magical occurrence, the cameras of NCN ended up in some police stations <laughs> and captured the jubilation of a handful of um, servicemen and women in uniform. Why, why would a government want to spew all sorts of propaganda over something that is so almost insignificant in the lives of people in terms of positive impact. Why? I'll tell you in a few words. Guyana is <coughs> not a real place. Now, Mr. Winston Jordan, again, your, your um, colleague, former minister, on this program, perhaps about two months or so ago, had indicated that according to his assessment mm -hmm. at that time, that food inflation, the food subgroup inflation, was in the region of, say, 13%. Others have projected that by the end of December 2022, which is a month from now, that this food subsector inflation is likely to go somewhere in the region of 20 or 20 plus percent. 
what does this do for managers of homes, women, wives, mothers, daughters? What is Christmas likely to look <laughs> look like? What you know, an egg is a hundred and what? A hundred plus dollars. A hundred and ten dollars. Yeah. Um, Marvin, look, there is not going to be much changes. People are already suffering. Eating chicken. That's five hundred dollars a pound now. Is a delicacy. Beef is nine hundred dollars a pound. Well, we now. don't eat beef anymore unless our Muslim brothers and sisters, you know, will bestow some kindness on some of our very poor people because they can't afford it. From the time you gave a thousand dollars to buy a pound of beef, that's it. The thousand dollars dead. You don't so have a bus fare remaining. Off, you have to take that off your menu, and that is what is going to happen. We said before that there were many households that were not having three meals per day. That's a fact. That there were households that was just having one meal, you have a cup of tea in the morning, whatever, you have one solid meal. Right? And what you're going to see now is people having to make hard choices. What you're going to see is more children on our streets begging. You're going to see more families out there begging. You're going to see more landlords asking people to remove themselves from their premises because they cannot meet their obligations. And so people are going to make hard choices. The education system is going to have a problem, especially at the lower level. Because parents will have to make a choice whether their children go to school five days a week, which is really, really heart-rending, or whether they go three days a week. And these are real situations. I'm not making them up. These are real situations. You talk to teachers, and they will tell you. And if that is happening on the coast, you can imagine what is happening in those far-flung communities where economic activity is low or non-existent and where people struggle, really struggle. That is why the survey is saying that 50% of the Guyanese population live on $1,000 a day, but I want to tell them they live on less than that a day. That's why you have all these people with food stalls all around the place. Because people will tell you, families will tell you, that it's better to buy a food for $500 and go home and share it up than to light the stove. for them to light that stove, find the oil, find the rice, find etc., etc., to cook a proper meal. A dismal, dismal situation. It is. Let's move to some positives. The proposals from the leader of the opposition and the parliamentary opposition by extension. There was a proposal that called on the government to pay public servants in particular a minimum living wage of $150,000 per month. Having regard to the computations that were done to arrive at this number. Instead what we see is the imposition of the 8%, the absence of consultation with the labor movement. And to complement that, we have had the Public Utilities Commission agreeing with the Guyana Water Incorporated mm -hmm. to a reconnection fee of $7,500 for water main. So <clears throat> if a mother, having done her budget and so on, goes out there into the market and finds herself short of resources now, having gotten the food, short of resources to pay water, that mother must now find somehow another $7,500 to reconnect that essential service to her home for her family and her children in particular. How important is it for the government to seriously address the question of this minimum livable wage of 
$150,000 for Guyanese public servants in particular. Uh, Marvin, I may be wrong, but my intuition is that the government understands that $150,000, which the opposition leader is calling for, and the entire opposition, as a livable wage, is bare bones. They have the figures. They have the indices from Bank of Guyana and Stats Bureau and so on. They will see that is bare bones, $150,000. And that is why the leader of the opposition went on a bit further. He asked that persons receiving this amount and below should be removed from the personal tax list. Mm -hmm. That they should not pay personal tax. And so that will be able to add something more to what they take home. He also asks for persons paying a certain amount and the here again, the statistics will show persons who pay on a particular borderline um, for electricity that we should remove that cost from those persons, let the government take that cost off. And so you remove that. When you do those things, you're addressing salaries across the board, whether it's private or public sector. It's, this is not just for public sector. This is across the board. Because last Saturday, I did hear the president um, intimated that while persons wanted the government to do more for public service in terms of increases, and I'm not quoting him here, um, that the government has to take into consideration the private sector ability to pay their staff at those levels. <laughs> and he's not the first one in the government I heard spoke of the concern for the private sector. I did hear the minister within the Ministry of the Presidency, responsible for finance, Dr. Ashley Singh, um, in one of his remarks, um, mentioned that too, that the government has to take into consideration. We're not saying don't do that. We're saying, look at the whole of Guyana, whether it's private, whether it's public. Our people are suffering. And given the projections, of the inflation in prices and so to come, our people, is go they're going to be worse off. And so it's time for you to start considering some measures that will affect these people across the board in a positive way, not in a negative way. Given an increase, it sounds good. But when I, as a head of a household, get out into the markets, get into the supermarkets, you know, then it's not a ball game because what is the basket of goods I'm taking home? And the next question is what I have taken home, how long will it last the family? Precisely. So it is very important that the government, we stop playing this little children politics because the opposition said it. Is it good for the country? Then give it some consideration. Is it good for the people? Give it some consideration. The, the leader of the opposition didn't just willy-nilly said these things. He also spoke about the NIS. This is something I want us I've to come to. Which I've spoken about earlier. And he, he, he said, look, you're going to ask where the government is going to get this excess money from. And we're saying... Take the excess from the profits that the oil companies are making now, given the war in Ukraine and Russia, and tax that excess because the prices have gone up. You predicted that the prices will be X. Now the prices are X, Y. So they're getting an excess inflow of revenue. And we're saying that excess, tax that excess and use those monies towards assisting our people. You, in the early stages of the program, 
pointed out a number of initiatives of the AP and UAFC government in terms of benefits to the working class population in particular. Wage increases, income tax adjustments. Um, of course, there was reduction of VAT from 16 to 14 percent, which also factors into that picture. And we had a fairly comfortable life. But we had no oil money at that stage. Now, we have this resource called oil, and we're getting a lot of money from it. Dr. Ashni Singh remarked that the revenues from oil are not adequate for the development of this country. I'm paraphrasing him. Now, when the government of Guyana signed this agreement with Exxon, it was at a price per barrel of about $60. There has been a boom. You just referred to the war and a number of um, factors that sent the price of oil up to in somewhere in the region between 100 and 120, mostly $100 per barrel. So you got about $40 per barrel in excess of what you projected. <laughs> but yet, without oil, the AP and UAFC achieved so much. With oil revenues in excess of projection, this administration is contending that the money is not enough to develop our country. How, how do you react to that? I, I think it's perhaps the government not wanting to feel what the ordinary man is feeling, what the ordinary woman who woke up this morning and know in her purse all she has is $3,000 to carry her and her family for the next week. I, I, I don't think they want to feel that. Sometimes I get the impression that the APNU was more people-centered and tried to ensure that they gave persons their campaign on a good life. And Guyanese have bought into that, to that good life. And nobody's taking that away from them. You speak to Guyanese, everybody wants to move their status from where they are to a higher position. Everybody, and that's a good thing. The second thing is that the government seems to believe that they must put in all these infrastructures within this five-year period. Despite we don't have the manpower, we don't have the labor. We don't have the weather. The w <laughs> well, they don't worry about weather. There's Bill Road, anything, rainfall, is sunshine, <laughs> anything. We don't have many of the things necessary to be able to utilize that large spending pot. So what you have is the government committing to all of these projects, putting all these monies. Yes, we need roads. Yes, we need better electricity, etc., and so on. But can we really do that at the expense of our people? Because while you're doing that, there are many communities that don't have running water. There are many communities that don't have proper roads, so they pay a higher cost for transportation. It is very hard to access health care because some places the ambulances can't go. Because either the road is not in a condition to accommodate the ambulance or there is no road at all. So there is a, a total neglect of our people and their needs Thing, basic needs which will enable them to enhance their lives and their livelihood in exchange for projects for the boys. You know, if you go around this country, you will see 
in our education institutions, large number of them, that their needs list is very long. Mm -hmm. You will also see in front of these schools have huge potholes. Right in First Street here, there's the Campbellville Secondary School and the mm -hmm. nursery school, right in front of the nursery school. Yeah. There are about four huge holes. I but I guess because Congress Place is accessible by, that, is accessible road. by mm -hmm. that road, that we're not going to fix it. But we endanger our children, our babies. Exactly. In front of my house, the road which runs in front of my house, one end of it has caved in. The children going to St. Pius Primary School I, I watch them in the mornings, in the middays, and in the afternoon. And I just pray that not one of these drivers hit any of them. They have to be pay hopscotch between the vehicles to get to school. And Minister Edgel cannot say that he doesn't know about it. I spoke to him twice. But I guess... And as everybody says, because the hole is in front of all yeah. the Lawrence, Lawrence House, you don't fix it. You spoke about ambulance and access, and it reminds me of a situation which occurred recently. At Kokwani, there's a health center. Mm -hmm. There was a particular health emergency in the village of Hururu along the Borbis River, an indigenous village. And it was necessary to get that patient out contact was made with the Kokwani Center. It turned out that the water ambulance that I believe yes, that you was placed there. commissioned there, That's right. the health center didn't have a driver for that ambulance, that water ambulance, and so it couldn't go. And so the residents of Uru said, well, you also have a road ambulance, as they put it, mm -hmm. which again, I believe you yes. commissioned. And the authorities at that health center promptly told them that that ambulance is only for transporting patients in between Kokwani and Linden. And regardless of the condition of the road to Hururu, which was in good shape, I'm told, they were not going to dispatch that ambulance there. So you could imagine the plight of the people in Hururu. I mean, you did an excellent job of equipping Kokwani with the necessary facilities, but they still do not serve the people of Hururu because of access and the issue of access. Let's... No, but Mervyn, yeah. before you go, and, and, and let me tell you, that is not just um, people not having access to the services that are there for them. But let us go back to this 8%. Because here again, here is a practical example of a person needing to access health care. Now the owners would be on that family to either borrow Which is what bed, they had to do. And incur costs on their head yeah. to get that patient to the health facility. Or be prepared to bury that patient. Or prepare to bury the patient. And the patient may have been a, or is a breadwinner for the family. Which is quite a tragedy so if that were the case. Yeah. Viewers, this is Nation Watch. I'm your host, Marvin Williams. My guest, Valda Lawrence, former Minister of Health and immediate past chairman of the People's National Congress Reform. Valda, you had proposed publicly on behalf of the coalition that the NIS is in crisis and that you believed, and in fact, the party believed that from the oil bonanza, a certain percentage should be allocated as a subvention to the National Insurance Board annually so that the social services supported by the National Insurance Scheme can continue to serve well our citizens, particularly our senior citizens. There's been no reaction coming from the government in this regard. It is evident that regardless of what is being preached 
the People's Progressive Party is numb to the needs of our people. How important is it in your view for the NIS to start receiving that subvention, say 2023, so that it can in fact become that viable scheme again, having started to hemorrhage um, since 2008? Mervyn, I can't stress the need for us to review the situation at NIS and to give redress to what is happening there in terms of their finances. NIS serves every working person who is a member of NIS whether you're working in an institution, a government institution, or a private institution, or whether you're working for yourself. The situation that NIS finds itself in was one which was orchestrated by political persons. NIS is an integral part of the working class and the retired working class. People pay NIS and look forward to the receipts from NIS so that they can address their livelihood. NIS pensioners have been calling over and over for an increase in their pensions and for their pensions to be addressed because what they receive is not sufficient for the investment that they've made over the years and it's not sufficient to carry them over, especially with their medical bills. Winston Jordan, the former finance minister, who was also in charge of NIS, looked at the recommendations from the board, from the studies which was done, and put in place monies for NIS where they would have had a subvention every year, and I think it was for four years or five years, until NIS was able to get on their feet. So this is not anything new. What I'm saying and what I have said is not anything new. It is something that started on the Winston Jordan. And I hope, I really, really hope as a guy in here, that is not because it's Winston Jordan who started this project, that the government has stopped doing it. I, I think the money was largely um, making good on a commitment made by the AP and UFC while in opposition that it will ensure that the monies lost to Clico yes, will be refunded to the National Clico Insurance Board. And, and the, the <coughs> income derived from the investment in the Burbies Bridge, which, which is, is zero. Nothing, yeah. Um, that this initiative would have been able to cushion yeah. those bad investments, I must say. Um, because at the end of the day, NIS helps the government in terms of providing services to its people. They do spectacles, medication, they reimburse for medical expenses, assist persons who are on sick leave with part of their salaries, etc. And so their, their services is a wide range of um, things which helps. Because imagine a person, imagine a woman is on maternity leave and she has complications. And she has to be on maternity leave for six months with a salary which she would have gotten 8% increase cannot suffice.
for those days for which she, she's not covered by annual leave or sick leave. And that is where the NIS steps in. So I believe that any government who cares about their people would want to ensure that now that we have this windfall of money, that this is one institution that we can invest in, that we should assist to get back on their feet, to find good investments so that they can now begin to reinvest, etc., and be able to take the challenges which they face on their own as they derive the income from those investments. So we, I believe that the government would want to plant a seed in NIS. Any government worth its grain of salt would want to plant a seed in NIS. And you know, I believe that this is where the unions and workers and other persons, other institutions and organizations come in. This thing is not an opposition government thing. This thing is a people's thing. And you need to speak about it. Because this is about the well-being of the people of Guyana. It, it might interest our viewers that the National Insurance Scheme founded in 1969, from since then, has touched the life of every single Guyanese. When you're born, your mother gets a maternity benefit. Mm -hmm. When you are sick, as long as you qualify, you get a sickness benefit for the period during which your employment was interrupted and your income from employment was interrupted. In your old age, you get a pension. If the NIS records are up to date and indicate that you, that you qualify. When you die, your surviving benefits um, your surviving relatives benefit from funeral grant and death benefit or survivor's benefit as the case may be. So it has touched the life of every Guyanese. From the womb to the tomb. Exactly. And it is, it is, it is an important and essential um, institution in our country's life. And it cannot, it cannot be allowed to go down. And so the politics has got to be removed from, from the management of NIS. I'll make reference to something I said before. The Minister of Finance, who's the head of the National Insurance Scheme, mm -hmm. made it clear that over 1,500 um, appeal cases were determined and settled and people got their benefits. But there's been no sitting of the appeals tribunal for two years. And he has accomplished this massive feat within a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what respect is there for the NIS legislation, which provides for the establishment of a, of a tribunal which operates independently of the board? Has the authority of that institution that organized uh, and, and legislated for um, tribunal, has that been removed? So, a lot of what is happening and a lot of the bragging that is taking place really speak to violation of laws and violation of people's rights. And not allowing the institutions to function. Precisely. So I would like to see the day when the National Insurance Fund becomes viable again. In 2008, I believe it was, mm -hmm. the trend started that the revenues from contributions became insufficient to meet the um, expenses relating to benefits. It is too important an, institu an institution to be allowed to go down the line, and whatever support it requires should be given, as you have outlined. And um, I believe it, re it requires a nonpartisan approach, a collective approach to ensuring that that, via that valuable institution is allowed Marvin, to grow. I did say that should the finance minister bring any request to the National Assembly for injection of monies into the NIS to sustain it and help it to become viable again, that the APNU stands ready to support it. And we still do. Because we believe in the NIS, we believe it is important for the nation. Two minutes wrap-up points, um, Walda, from you for the conversations that, the conversation that we've had 
for the last almost one hour, two minutes Th around. Thank you, Marvin. I just want to say to Guyanese that thanks for believing in the good life. And I want to remind you that now you can put the APNU on one side and you can put the PPP on the other side. And you can be the judge of which of these two parties in government was more people-centered and more concerned about your daily lives and the lives of your children, your grandchildren, and the future generations of this country. I believe the opposition leader especially has been on the forefront pushing and speaking out on the injustices in terms of our people being able to benefit from the oil wealth and the excesses from the sale of oil in this country. And I ask you to listen. I ask you to read our press statements and you be the judge. Thank you and do have a wonderful day and a Merry Christmas. Thank you very much Mrs. Valda Lawrence for joining me on today's program of Nation Watch for Sunday 27th November 2022. We have been discussing salary increases, cost of living, and related matters. And I would leave you viewers with what's on the lips of many who, whom I've engaged with in the last few days. 8% can't work. 8% is I pass. God bless. Till we meet again next Sunday.